Jean lessons this evening after our study on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And we're entering into a study that is, is really not necessary for us necessarily to know this to go to heaven. But there is some there are things in here we need to know. And there are passages of scripture that people misunderstand. And consequently, they misuse or misteach those lessons. And Matthew chapter 24 falls into that <coughs> particular category. There are various outlines available <clears throat> that I have in my archives from different people on this on this subject. This one's done by Roy Deaver, and I have great respect. Uh, Brother Deaver's gone on to his reward now, and I have great respect for his teaching, and I think he did an excellent job on this particular lesson. I have given it verbatim the way he wrote it, and he used the American Standard Version from 1901. So when you see quotations that read with the older English, you'll understand why. We have an outline and here, and then, then we take the outline and we follow that through the lesson. I think this lesson came from a book... Um, done at the Denton Lectures in 1982. I, I don't think I noted that in here, but that's really not in, necessary for us to understand. Let's look at, the, look at the outline, then we'll start looking at our text. We have an introduction here, a consideration of the larger context uh, would be valuable, but space limitation does not allow that, so we don't look at every all the context, but we are looking at the particular uh, chapter itself with the Lord's, you'll have the disciples' questions, and then you have the Lord's statements, and you have parallel accounts in the different Gospels, and you have two comings in, in uh, Matthew 24, two ends as a result of those comings, and two different worlds, and we'll dig into that. We have the first coming is the Jerusalem coming. And there are various comings of the Lord, and we'll look at the significance of, significance of those things and some possible misleading signs, the real sign. What was to be done when the real sign was evident? The meaning of the symbolism. We have a parable in Matthew 24, the parable of the fig tree. Then we have special consideration of Matthew 24, verse 34. And then we have a transition text from the Jerusalem coming to the final coming of Christ. And it's critical that we understand this uh, ourselves and then others who see, read Matthew 24 and they think, well, it all has to do with the end of time and, and the wars and rumors of wars that's going on today. That's, that's not a part of uh, our current day or history after the destruction of Jerusalem. We'll get into that. But then you'll see that the sermon continues. It's called the Sermon from the Mount of Olives or Mount Olivet. We're not going into chapter 25, but Matthew 25 is a continuation of this discourse. And then uh, we have destruction of Jerusalem, the time and the sign, the final coming and judgment. Only the Father knows, and there will be no sign for the final coming of the Lord. And I'm hoping my voice will hold up the entire time tonight. I may call upon some of you to read, and if you do, if you don't mind, read loudly so anyone who's watching online can hear you. Um, notice Roman numeral one. And let's just go to our text, whatever translation of the Bible we're using. 
and we will begin with Matthew chapter 24, although everything that is spoken with regard to this particular event is not in Matthew. We have uh, Mark's account and Luke's account as well. But you'll see in verse 1 of Matthew 24 that Jesus came out from the temple. And he was going away from the temple and his disciples came up to, a point, came up to point out the temple buildings to him. As if he didn't know these things, but they were showing him and, and he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Now certainly, obviously the disciples were showing these buildings to Jesus because they were so magnificent. And they evidently had a little bit of pride in that, being Jews. This was Herod's temple that was built, and uh, it was the last temple that was built, and obviously very beautiful to see. And yet the Lord doesn't say anything about how pretty it is, does he? He says it's going to be destroyed, doesn't he? He says not one stone will be left upon another, and which will not be torn down. And so, so we, we'll move from the temple to the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> and so as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. And they have two questions. You may not notice that right off. The first question is, tell us when will these things happen? And the second one, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? I don't think they intended to ask two questions. I think they thought they were just asking one question. But in reality, they were asking two questions. Because Jesus did, breaks this down into two different comings. Sometimes when we ask questions, we don't know what we're asking. But we let the Bible teach us. So if you look at Matthew's account, <clears throat> the disciples uh, ask, ask these things. So when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And what shall be the sign of the end of the, end of the world, end of the age? Now in Mark's account, Mark chapter 13 and verse 4, what does that say, Tony? It's on your sheet there if you don't want to look it up in your Bible, do it however you wish. It's on page two. Yeah. Now, Lisa, you get ready to read what Luke said. 22, what's Mark's account. What was the question? What did the disciples ask? It says, When shall these things be? What shall be the sign when these things are all about to be accomplished? So, in, in Luke's account, Elisa, Luke 21 7. Now, you have three different accounts, but don't you have essentially the same questions in each one? Okay, so Matthew's account, at least on the surface, seems to indicate three questions. However, it has to be recognized that the disciples might have been thinking of one event. Um... I noted there were two questions, and Brother Deaver says there were that it looks like they were asking three. Um, at any rate, the thing about it is they probably were thinking about one particular event, and probably in their minds when they when Jesus said the temple would be torn down to the point that there wouldn't be a stone left on another, they probably thought that meant the end of the world. 
And, and what, what will be the signs? What, what signs should we look for? And the sign of the end of the world. And I think that that's, they're probably, Brother Deaver said they asked three questions in Matthew. I believe that the, the last two there in these statements, from my perspective, is the last two are one question. But they all have to do with the same thing. No, in their minds, they do. And here's what a lot of people think. They think the whole chapter is about the end of time. But it's not. And we'll look, look into that. So, they, over, they associated the overthrow of the stones with the end of the world. They associated the end of the world with the Lord's final coming. And Brother Deaver says it is the conviction of this writer that the three accounts of the three accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, of the disciples' questions are all identical in meaning. Even though the phraseology is not exactly the same, they were thinking of the final, final coming and of the end of the world, as most people do with Matthew chapter 24. I said it may not be a salvation issue, but I don't want to, to downplay anything that the Lord taught. If you don't understand this, it's good to know. Um, and so when they assume that these things which the Lord talked about would take place at the end of the world, however, it does not follow necessarily that they were correct in their assumption. The disciples, when they asked these questions, they were not speaking by the Holy Spirit. They were simply asking a question. When the Lord made his statement, the Lord was speaking from heaven. And in their mind was, well, the end of time. When's that going to be, Lord? What will be the sign of that? And so there are different comings or shall we say um, visits, you can use a different word, of the Lord. And the first one is the Jerusalem coming. So let's read, let's see, well, let's go ahead and read the paragraph. Uh, Mike, do you have that first paragraph there under the Jerusalem coming? If you read it, please. The mere fact of reference Lord's coming does not prove that reference is made to his final coming. The scriptures refer to one, the Lord's first coming to live among men, two, his coming on Pentecost of Acts 2, Matthew 16, 28, Thessalonians 4, 16, and 5, oh, three, his coming in human experiences, and that's Revelation 2, 16, and Revelation 3.20. Four, his final coming, uh, Zechariah 14.22. You're, you're mixing them up. You're mixing them up there. Take your time. Nobody's rushing. And five, his coming in judgment upon Jerusalem. And that's Matthew 24.30, Matthew 26.64, and Zechariah 14.1-1-2. The providential destruction of Jerusalem is definitely called a coming of the Lord. The coming was spoken of frequently in the Old Testament prophecies. It is this coming which our Lord discusses in verse 4 through 35. All right, so notice verses 4 through 35 are dealing with the Jerusalem coming. When you get to verse 36, and I'm just going to... I'm going to read verses 35 and 36 together. He says in verse 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows. But before this, he has explained things to look for in a coming. So you can't have the Lord in conflict with himself or contradiction to himself. He's talking about two different comings. It should go without saying <coughs> that even secular history recorded the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. There are some people among our 
membership, our fellowship, who believe that that was the Lord's final coming and he's not coming back again. Now that's weird, isn't it? But there, you know, there, there's some people who believe that. And, and maybe it could become a salvation issue. If you start listening to things that people are saying that are not true, it could lead you to believe something else that's not true. And I want to say one more thing. Uh, well, I'll say it later. So, perhaps this is the proper point at which to stress the significance of the words, these things, in the context. The Lord has used these words in 2336. And that's where Jesus really raked the scribes and Pharisees over the proverbial coals. And what does Matthew 23, 36 say, Linda? Now, I'm not going to go back and read what all those things were, but I do know this, whatever those things were, Jesus said they would come upon what generation? This. So would that be the people who lived at that particular time? If I yes. say this yes. generation of people is is living longer than this people were a hundred years ago. Well, we know we're talking about today. So I want to say this too. Read your Bible slowly and carefully and because sometimes we can read I, I, I've been listening to uh, to some text today on my iPad because it's the text I want to preach from on Sunday and I'll listen to it over and over and over then I'll sit down and I'll read it and and it's so easy to miss something or hear something once and then you hear it again and it gives you another thought about what it can, what it means. So the Bible is rich that way. So we have those things that would take place on that generation and uh, and so you, I'm not going back into the 23rd chapter. I'm just we're just pointing that out. So in 24.3, the disciples asked the question, when shall these things be? The Lord had just said, see ye not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now what things was he talking about right there? What did the disciples tell Jesus to look at? The temple. Oh, it must have been beautiful. You know, look at this, Lord. And so those, so those things, and Jesus had said that there'll not be one stone left upon another in verse 2, the latter part, which shall not be torn down. Now, it was he was responding to their commentary on the temple. And it's obvious that he's talking about the destruction of the temple. Okay? So in their minds... Well, that's the end of time, I guess. We said these things, he's talking about the building. These things is something different in chapter 23. He's talking about things that would happen. Now, so in verse 8 of Matthew 24, the Lord said, See ye not all these things? Verily I say to you, I'm sorry, um, Where did I see? It? Okay, I, I got behind. In verse 8, the Lord said, But all these things are the beginning of travail. In verse 33, the Lord says, Even so ye also, when ye see the, all see all these things, know ye that he is nigh, even at the doors. Now, if I were standing there listening to Jesus, and he said, I, I'm going to look at the New American Standard here, he says, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs, verse 8. And then what's the next verse? Verse 33. Jesus said, so you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. If you were standing there and you listened carefully to that, 
Who would you think he was talking to? Yourself. Yourself, if you were standing there listening. If Tony says, when you see somebody come in the door, would you let me know? Because I need to talk to him. Yeah. I think he's talking to me. And so Jesus is talking to the disciples, and, and we're going to look at the things they would look for, but it's important to recognize that can't be the end of time unless those men are still alive. Right? Can't be the end of time. Either that or those men are still living, looking for those things. And it's been verified that Jerusalem was destroyed, especially the temple. And so he says in verse 34 of Matthew 24, he continues, um, what does that say, Sammy? I'm sorry, Matthew 24. 34. 34. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Now, now, up to now, whatever he said was going to happen, when Jesus says this generation will not pass away until all these things take place, obviously, what generation was he talking about? Something in the future or people living then? Right. People living then. And I used the illustration a moment ago about how this generation lives longer than, say, people similar to us 100 years ago. And if Jesus says this generation shall no way, in no way pass away, until you see a woman president. Now, he didn't say that, but obviously we think he was talking about people living right now, wouldn't we? I hope we don't get one, but that's another discussion. Anyway, now, these refer to the same thing and definitely relate to the destruction of Jerusalem, not the Lord's final coming. So let's read Matthew 24, um, Beginning with verse 3. Elisa, if you would read 3 through 6. Or read 3 through 6. Yeah. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. Okay. Um. Mike, read verses 7 through 14, if you would. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. And these are the beginnings of sorrows. And they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Okay. Now, it's important to recognize a couple of things here. He said that, talked about wars and rumors of wars, but who did he say not to be frightened? Who's he talking to? Those disciples. Those disciples. He's not talking to us in 2022. You are not to be frightened. I wasn't living then. I wasn't standing there, but Peter, James, and John, and Philip and Bartholomew and all those men were standing there. And uh, he says, but that's not the end. Which means 
these things would occur before the destruction of Jerusalem. Then he talks about nation rising against nation, but notice <coughs> verse 9, they will deliver people in the future to tribulation. Is that what he said? Deliver you. Let me ask you a Bible question from the book of Acts. Did, did, do we read about some of these persecutions happening to the Lord's apostles and, and other servants like Stephen? Yeah. And so Jesus was talking about something that would happen after this discussion and before the destruction of Jerusalem. Because if I say, Mike, this is going to happen to you, let's say if I need you, you're going to be persecuted sometime in the near future. Well, I wouldn't be talking about somebody 2,000 years later, would I? I'd be talking about Mike. If I were standing there, if I were listening, saying, you mean you're talking to me, Lord? Yeah, I'm talking to you, Peter, or whoever. Uh, and at that time, now your translation read a little differently in verse 10. It said then, didn't it? In verse 10. Uh, okay, the way the New American Standard reads, you can take then, okay, we will, we're building a house, today we will pour the concrete slab, then we will start the, the framing or whatever, all right? And so then or at that time, many will fall away, when? When this persecution takes place. Do you remember in Luke chapter 8 where Jesus talked about the seed falling among the, the, on the rocky soil and it would spring up for a little while and then it would dry up and wither away and one of the reasons when he explained it was because of persecution. People fall away because of persecution. And while that's still true today, this was talking about then. Some people could handle the persecution and some, they deny the Lord. And, and they, would, they, would not be, they would not be able to enter the kingdom. And he says, you know, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to be hated. I'm going to tell you something. We are in a minority even today. We weren't living then they were hated to the point that they put uh, James and John in prison, didn't they? They put uh, Paul and uh, Silas in prison, didn't they? Why? All they're doing is preaching. Well, the, the auditors didn't like what they heard. And so, and, and even today, I'll just take this real quick sidebar. People today, younger people in particular, are denying the existence of an eternal, divine being called God. Therefore, they deny the validity of this book that we're studying from tonight as being a divine product. And you try to talk to them, and they're ugly. They don't like you. You're just ignorant. You don't know anything. And, and evolution is a fact. No, it's not. But they think it is. And they hate us if we try to say that there's an eternal living God. I believe there is. And I'm glad there is. Because I don't want, even if it weren't, even if it weren't, who wants to die and go into oblivion? And Of course, it's not going to be that way. It's not going to be that way. But we're hated by people when we stand up for the truth. They're not going to like you. And so they didn't like them. In verse 10, it says, At that time or then many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. The pressure would be on. The pressure would be on. And next thing is a warning of what in verse 11? False prophets. False prophets. And somebody could say, yeah, that's talking about today. Well, that's true today, 
but he was not talking about today. He was talking about then. It doesn't mean there aren't false prophets today, but there were then and, and mislead many. And because, of, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. People like, I was working on a lesson this past Sunday, and I don't know if I said it or not, I had it in my outline. We don't like to be told what to do. Most of us do. But we don't, surely we don't mind God telling us what to do. Some people don't want God telling them what to do. And lawlessness produces cold indifference. And that's what was going to happen. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Now, in principle, in principle, is that not still true? I'm not talking about a principle. But here, those at that time who could handle the pressure of persecution, could handle the pressure of uh, internal strife in their family because of Jesus. Um, you you got to, there's a line in the sand, as it were. You got to choose, be a, choose which side you're going to be on. And the ones, and here's the thing. So I'm going to choose Jesus, Daddy, or wife, or husband. I'm choosing the Lord. I believe Him. I'm living for Him. And, it, and, and if I get persecuted for it, so be it. Because when I die, I'm going to be just fine. And you're not. I mean, that's a fair discussion for it, isn't it? And so, verse 14 is very interesting. This gospel of the kingdom. Which gospel of the kingdom? When Jesus has been preaching. I want to tell you something. Jesus covered everything even before everything happened. Did he not tell his disciples that he was going to be put to death and rise again the third day? That's a part of the gospel message, isn't it? Now, when he said that, it hadn't happened, but since then it has. And so when Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, all the gospel had been revealed. So when Peter and the eleven stood up on Pentecost, they had everything they needed to know. And yet, Jesus is saying that the gospel would pre be preached in the whole world before the destruction of Jerusalem. Somebody says, well, I don't know about that, preacher. Well, I'll, I want to go and look at some of these notes, and then we'll come to that here. Go on to page page four, where you have a notice here from non-inspired historians. You've got Justin, Jerome, Irenaeus, Origen, Josephus. They all record the fact that immediately prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, there were many deceivers and false Christs. The Lord said further, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you not be troubled, for all these things need to come to pass, but the end is not yet. Wars and rumors of wars would come, but these things did not constitute the end which the Lord had in mind and about which he was speaking. That, that was separate and apart from the destruction of Jerusalem. It was just in the time frame between when Jesus said that and when Jerusalem was destroyed. And so the Lord continued, For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in divers or various places. Um, and, and Brother Deaver says this is an amazing statement from our Lord. At the time he made it, there was peace with the Roman Empire. Shortly after this Olivet prophecy, Palestine and other parts of the Roman Empire were engulfed in strife, insurrections, and wars. And secular history would bear it out. Jesus said it would happen. And this was after he spoke and before the destruction of Jerusalem. He says even extra biblical history records the the uh, records the earthquakes and famines characteristic of the years prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. During this time, the Jews themselves suffered indescribable persecution. Thousands were put to death. And again, the Lord stressed that they 
these things were not the end. These note he notice that he says these things are the beginning of travail. Verse eight, or my New American Standard says the beginning of birth pangs. I think there's some women in this room that just might relate to that. If you had a baby, and uh, I've been in the, the the birthing room when all four of my children were born. I thought that woman was going to hit me one time. She was in travail, buddy. It wasn't her normally, though. We weren't normal then, were you? And I stand there talking to a nurse. Boy, she got mad. She said, you need to be paying attention to me. I thought, you're right. You're going through a difficult time. And it was silly of me to be doing that. Birth pangs. Painful. You know, they give a woman an epidural today to kind of help with that. Most women haven't had that ever. Did you have all your babies naturally except for Amanda? Yeah, because she Amanda was born cesarean. Um, I can't relate to it, but I figure everybody had heard the screaming. You remember the old cowboy shows, and they hear all that noise in the back room, you know, and they say, you know, you got a baby. These were, this was a figure speech. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was looking at that verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom, and I was just thinking the gospel is the good news, right? It's the good news of Jesus coming as the Christ, and the kingdom is always referred to as equal as the church, the church and the kingdom. You know, that's another name of it. So the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the church, the good news of the kingdom. That right there should tell us that that's talking about their time period and not the end of the world. Just though, just that little phrase there. And the church had not yet come into existence when Jesus said that, but it would. Um, I'm, I'm giving you the the, this lesson so you can read it over. It's a wonderful study. I thought Brother Deaver did an excellent job with it. <clears throat> so, but even so, when he talks about the end, enduring to the end, verse 13, he's still talking about until the destruction of Jerusalem. And uh, obviously some Christians would go through some of that. The Lord continues used to think about the end and he said and this I'm on page four now near the about a third from the bottom and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony unto all the nations now I want you to think about that for a minute all the nations Jesus said in Matthew's account of the gospel, of his gospel, Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And Mark 16, 15, he said, into all the world. Now, we got less time than I'd like to have, so I'll have to speed this up. But now, the Apostle Paul was not a part of this group. He was a born out of due season, as he once wrote. And when he started preaching, he, you know, Peter and the apostles, they stayed in the area of Jerusalem and ministered to the Jewish people for the most part. They stayed in that part of the world. Now, they would travel some distance, but where did Paul go? He went all over the world, didn't he? He went all over the world. I believe he made it to Spain. I believe he did. I'd have to look the reference up. But I want you to notice what Paul, by the, look here at the bottom of the page, <clears throat> where it talks about the faith of the saints of Rome was, was spoken of where? Throughout the whole world. Throughout the whole world. 
the news of the faithful of Rome was traveling all over the world. Romans 1.8. By the time of Paul's letter to the brethren at Colossae, the gospel was bearing fruit and increasing where? Colossians 1.6. Further, Paul plainly declares that at the time of the Colossian letter, the gospel had been what? In all creation under heaven. The world had heard it. You know, I don't have to explain that. Somebody said, what about the, the, the North American, the people living on the North American continent? How do you know there were people on the North American continent at that time? I'm not so sure there were. We really don't know how long they've been here. They came over on what they call that Bering Strait out of Russia. At one time, it was a land bridge, wasn't it? How long have they been here? I don't know. But either way, the gospel had been made known in the whole world. And Paul, Jesus said in verse 14 that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to what? To who? To all the nations. And then the end will come. Now, <laughs> some people say, well, you know, that's talking about today. I want to ask you something. Has every nation on the face of this earth had the opportunity to hear the gospel? So if that's true, Jesus should have already come back, shouldn't he? He wasn't talk talking about the future that far. He was talking, and it's amazing to me that they got the gospel to the whole world before Jerusalem was destroyed. I think it's also interesting that that, that happened. That gave every living, breathing Jew the chance to know the fulfillment of of the Old Testament and who fulfilled it. They could they, they could have known that. And what they did with it's up to them. And G, God's plans will not be thwarted. And so we're going to have to stop there and pick up at the bottom of page four next time. Go ahead and read this and you'll be enlightened with it. And you come back next week and you'll tell me some things that you might not have known tonight. I hope you can. Today is the second. second. So it'll be the ninth morning.